All right. So again, thank you for joining Public Lab's open hour. Um, I just wanted to go ahead and take a moment to introduce some of our partners and co-facilitators today. Um, we have myself, I'm Ashley, I'm the community manager at Public Lab. And then we also have my colleague Stevie, who will be joining us today and helping answer questions in the chat. We have Shannon and Ted from Brack Tracker, who will be um, helping facilitate this conversation. Plus we have uh, Patricia or Pat Popple on the line. Joe, um, if you'd like to go ahead and raise your hands, thank you. And then we'll also be joined by um, two other guests, uh, Ken and Dwight, who will be joining us maybe a little bit later after our brief introductions. So again, thank you. I just wanted to give a short clip for those of you that are not familiar with Public Lab, welcome. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and take a moment to share a screen here in just a second to do a short 30 second video um, so you guys can learn a little bit more about who we are as an organization and online community. So one second, please. Whoops, one second, y'all, the audio was off, so it'll be just a moment. Public Lab is an open community which develops affordable, accessible, open source, do-it-yourself techniques to investigate environmental issues. We think citizens should be involved in framing questions, interpreting results, and drawing conclusions. Public Lab began during the Deepwater Horizon oil spill to address the information blackout which Gulf Coast residents faced. We used balloons to send cameras up a thousand feet, taking detailed aerial photos of the spill. Today, our growing community is working on a new generation of tools to make citizen science better. So I'll go ahead and drop that. If you had trouble hearing the audio, I will go ahead and drop the, the text form so you can go ahead and read it. And we'll also be linking it after the event um, on our uh, notes that we do in our archive. So again, we record all open hours for Public Lab and post them on an archive on our website so that people can review them after if they weren't able to join. And we will also be dropping anything that's linked in the chat today um, for you to explore afterward will be listed with that recording as well. And I'll be sharing that with Brack Tracker if that's how you heard about it um, today and joining us. So that way you can go ahead and visit those after. So there's no need to take additional notes, but I'll go ahead and take a moment to pass it over to Shannon and Ted to introduce Frack Tracker. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. So to give, I'm Shannon Smith. I'm the manager of communications and development at Frack Tracker. And just to give a general overview of uh, Frack Tracker, it's a nonprofit research research organization that monitors and communicates the environmental and health risks that are associated with oil, gas, and petrochemical industries uh, in the United States. And we provide a lot of visual and technical tools to assist different communities in their campaigns to protect themselves against the negative impacts of these extraction related activities, uh, particularly those that are associated with fracking. Um, since 2012, Frack Tracker Alliance has been a leading resource for maps, data, and analyses in our field. Um, our work is highly collaborative, so we encourage everybody to reach out to us if you want more information. Uh, we often respond to the direct needs of our aligned allies, and we translate our work to uh, various audiences like uh, residents, researchers, policymakers, and other partner organizations. So ultimately, our work is contributing to the just transition to renewable energy. Um, and we, found, we value open data sharing. Sorry, my cat loves to join me on Zoom. Um, and we, yeah, we encourage participatory data collection, which we do through our submission-based mobile app, which Ashley will link to in the notes um, to this open hour. So you'll get the link to that. Um, and our outreach activities are geared toward inspiring citizens like you all to take action to benefit our shared environment. So Ashley, should I go ahead with uh, the introduction to the audio story? 
Yeah, that sounds good. And unless you uh, Ted want to join and add anything about your guys' roles real quick before you do that. Uh, I, was, I was just going to say, my name is Ted Alk. I, I've been with Frag Tracker since 2013. And uh, I've known Pat and the others on this panel since that time. And I've really been inspired by the work that they do and their urge to get the, the impacts of sand mining out to a bunch of people. And I've been working with them to do that. So uh, it's an important story that I think very few people know about. So I'm really excited that we're going to be getting the word out to some folks here today. So thanks for joining us. Awesome, and that's ready for you to go, Shannon. And we'll be sharing um, from the audio stories that Frack Tracker did in collaboration with Save the Hills Alliance and Public Lab. We'll be sharing short clips for you to listen to get context and ground us today. And then we'll be doing a short um, an honorarium for today's event before we go on to discussion. Thank you. All right. So I'm gonna share my audio here. Um, second. Uh, all right. So this is an introduction to the audio story that accompanies today's open hour. The audio story is called Undermined. It was produced by Public Lab and Frack Tracker. And this is the introduction, the brief introduction to that. Fracking. It's a technology that has spread across massive areas of the United States in the last decade, scarring landscapes with hundreds of thousands of oil and gas wells. The process drills for oil and natural gas by boring a hole into layers of shale rock, and that shale rock contains tiny pockets of oil and gas that were previously too expensive to extract. Through a process called horizontal directional drilling, fracking operations are able to pump silica sand, water, and chemicals into those tiny pockets. The round pieces of silica sand are like tiny marbles that support fractures so they don't collapse, but allow for the oil and gas to escape and flow up the well. But while the many dangers of fracking have been well documented, like the health impacts from exfoliation, air pollution that can cause asthma and other respiratory issues, spills in rivers and streams, and the release of the potent greenhouse gas methane, an often overlooked side effect of the industry comes from the mining of the silica sand itself. On this podcast, we explore frack sand mining. How is the sand mined and where does it come from? Which companies are mining the land? And how does the industry treat its neighbors? And who bears the brunt of the problems that accompany frack sand mining, which range from displacement to impacts on farming, to water contamination, to air pollution? From Frack Tracker Alliance and Public Lab, with support from Save the Hills Alliance, this is Undermined. Okay, hopefully the audio was okay on that. I was able to hear it, um, but for those of you that maybe weren't able to, again, we'll be uh, dropping a link. Both Frack Tracker and um, Public Lab have this available either on our website um, or our sound clouds, which I just dropped into the chat. Um, and it looks like we were able to um, have Ken join us today, who will be uh, joining in introductions just momentarily. He's one of our speakers with Patricia. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and ask Shannon if you're able to um, share the image that I shared with you earlier, the link. I'm going to go ahead and today's event is a special event um, in regards to this frack tracking conversation um, with our partners. Um, we wanted to take a moment to honor one of the activists local um, in the Wisconsin area from the Ho-Chunk Nation. Um, his name is um, Bill Greendeer or also Rekumani. Um, which stands for Walks with the South Wind. Um, Bill, or Rekumani, was born um, in the Toma, Wisconsin area to um, Orville and Jean Day Greendeer in Toma, Wisconsin. Um, there are a lot of things that he was active in in the 66 years that he was on the planet with us. Um, unfortunately, he passed in November of last year, and we wanted to take a moment to make sure that we honor his work. Um, so with that, I'll just be reading a short introduction to some of his work that he um, provided both in fighting frack sand and also in keeping his cultural communities connected to their ancestral territory. So William Greendeer Rakumani was an elder in the Ho-Chunk Nation whose territory has historically spanned Wisconsin, Minnesota, Illinois, and Iowa. He is from the Deer Clan and a member of the Medicine Lodge. He spent the first eight summers of his life in Lodge and had a deep connection to the natural world. 
His experiences and sacred connection with the natural world offered prayer when he was harvesting any plant or animal and learning how to teach this and how to live in a good way on his land in the Southwest Wisconsin. His hopes were to rejuvenate his old farm and native plants by also protecting beavers and others that called their home in the valley where he lived and sharing this with his family on their land and many other tribal community members that were affected by frack sand mining activities in addition to the damage caused by the cranberry growing industry in Southwest Wisconsin. Um, William Green Deer Rakumani also is known um, to be a very fierce advocate for um, the rights of nature. He co-founded the Sacred Water, Sacred Land, walked the Enbridge Pipeline from Illinois to Superior, Wisconsin, and began studying many constitutions, including that of the country of Ecuador and their indigenous communities for a way to protect what the Ho-Chunk people hold sacred. Rakumani's first brought the proposal for the Rights of Nature Amendment to the Ho-Chunk Nation Constitution at their annual general council um, back in September of 2015. This received a majority vote in favor, and this led with his lead to the rights of nature resolutions that continued to be passed at the general council um, and have been held up in different electoral processes and constitutional amendments. But despite roadblocks, he was able to get the Ho-Chunk Nature Legislator to establish the rights of nature work group with his role as community liaison and continued to work as the goal of the Ho-Chunk Nation to make sure that they were the first tribe in the United States to enshrine the rights of nature and their constitution following many other indigenous communities around the world who are working to protect their ancestral land and rights and cultural values. Um, he's been invited to speak at many numerous educational institutes and conferences, and that's why we're wanting to honor him today. He spoke previously at the Nature World and Law Symposium at the Northwest Indian College, which is here in Washington State, where I'm joining you all today, and also the Rights of Nature Symposium at Tulane Law School. Um, he's in continual conversation and making sure that these values, right, both here when he was on the land and while he's now with the creator, um, passing these laws of jurisprudence onto many other community members. Um, he previously lived on a 200 acre home um, that spanned the hills, valleys, forest springs, and trout streams in the Driftless and co-created with his community an eco-village and educational center that modeled sustainable development in line with indigenous ecological knowledge. Um, I'd welcome any of you, if you have a moment, you could go ahead and drop anything you'd like to say about Bill Amran Rakumani today in the chat, or if you'd like to unmute yourself, I'll go ahead and give you all about a couple minutes here to just say anything if you knew him personally. But otherwise, um, we can take a moment to just pause before we start our conversation and introductions with our guests. Thank you for listening. This is Pat Popple, and uh, Bill will be greatly missed by all the groups in Wisconsin. And um, may he rest in peace. All right, and with that, um, I'll close with what they do here in uh, the Pacific Northwest and Coast Salish Treaty areas where I live, that we say and end that remembrance with all my relations. All right, thank you. Um, so we'll go ahead and I'll turn it over to Shannon and Ted to do introductions for our speakers today. Sure, I do. I can, I can lead this off. Um, I would like to first introduce Pat Popple. Uh, Pat, uh, Pat, I think we met in, uh, I was looking back, we met in uh, September of 2016. Um, Pat is, uh, she's what I call the matriarch of the movement. Um, I've learned so much from Pat in the however many years I've known her. We've had frequent conversations about all things sand mining. Um, she has her finger on the pulse of this, of this stuff in real time, and I think that she's a real kind of tribute to the people of Western Wisconsin. Um, you know, I, I, I think that we've really struggled with trying to get media and others to kind of look at this issue, but it's not, it's not for a lack of Pat's, you know, persistence and fearlessness. So Pat, um, that's Pat Popple. Um, maybe I can introduce, say a couple words about Ken uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll hand it over to everyone. But um, I just want to say also about Ken. He's, uh, I met Ken when, Pat introduced me, I think, in August of 2016 to him. Uh, Ken is one of those people that really has his finger on the pulse as well. 
in the local area, Barron and Chippewa County, Wisconsin. I think his vantage point as a dairy farmer, as a very practical person, I think he really saw through the industry and really educated me. We spent a whole day together walking around, or driving around Western Wisconsin. And between Pat and Ken, you know, that was like a, that was a master course in learning about the impacts of sand mining. So, so those are those two individuals. I don't know if Dwight's on yet. Uh, yes, I'm on. Okay. Um, and then Dwight Swenson, uh, he's, Dwight, you're in Hickston, correct? Correct. Yeah, so Dwight is, uh, Dwight is equally uh, informed as to the impacts of sand mining. Um, and I think we have, we have a kindred spirit in the sense that we both un don't think that reclamation of these sites is possible. I think we think it's a dubious claim. Uh, and Dwight has also been a huge help to me in understanding sand mining, given that I don't live there. So um, I'll hand the floor over to those three individuals if they wanna add to that or so. Yes, and thanks for joining us, Dwight. Sure. Um, and thanks for that, Ted. Um, if you'd like, uh, we're just going to go ahead and start off our panelists with some basic questions um, to just get us grounded again from the audio that Shannon and Joe brought to us. Um, so I'll turn it over to Pat um, for this first question, but any of you others, please welcome and join yourself um, after Patricia's comments. So Pat, I just would like to ask you if you could speak to us a little bit more about, you know, the general costs that come with frac sand mining. As you see it, what success and failures have you seen communities face with this in Wisconsin? And if you were to name top five concerns of your neighbors for these sites, what would they be? Uh, concerns. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, there are many and to limit to five would be very difficult for me. I can try, but there may be others and others, the other people who are joining in on this activity probably can add others. But um, it's a deep concern. Actually, when we started this, when frac sand mining came to town here in Chippewa Falls and in the rural area of Chippewa County. Um, I think um, probably some of the concerns that, that I can mention are, and in particular uh, is the air quality and what that what has been done with the air quality to impact all the residents around these frac sand mines and not only around the frac sand mine or the processing plant or the transload station itself but actually all along the tracking system if you take a you know transload um, station and you have a train with a hundred cars or cars being pulled by a diesel or several diesels and transporting all of that material out of Wisconsin is a deep concern. We, uh, we know that um, uh, silica is the major part of all of this and uh, we don't always see all the regulations being enforced. In fact, none of them are, very few of them are actually reinforced or, or no, there are no citations or uh, a lack of any kind of discussion effort on the part of the DNI to, um, to stop the companies from doing what they're doing. Also, there's a concern about water. You know, we, we now know that the frac sand mines are actually polluting aquifers in some areas. And if not the aquifer, at least the drinking well or wells, and also the uh, areas where uh, the frac sand mine is actually located. We also know that, for example, um, we have sludge or industrial waste being deposited on, uh, deposited on highways. When you move, for example, from Chippewa Falls and the processing plant out to the rural area where this material, this sludge is, dry, is uh, put back into the mine again, it, it really is a detriment to many uh, because no one really knows what's in the water unless they test it. And so we have been making a great deal of effort to have people test their water or even some counties now have gotten into doing that. So um, the, other, the other concern is reclamation. You know, um, like Ted, I, I don't believe that there's going to be ever a good reclamation with these, some of these frac sand mines. If you look at the pictures, that Ted has taken since 2013. Ted, I met you in 2013, really, via email and telephone conversations. 
because he took pictures of all of these areas in Chippewa County and Barron County. And um, the immensity, uh, you know, there may be a small Braxton mine, very small, 40 acres, but then they stretch out into 700, 800,000. We have uh, the, the plan for uh, acreage in, um, in the town of Howard, again, at about 1,300 or to 1,500 acres, where all three of these things, the mine, the processing plant, the transfer station would be located. So some of these places are huge in terms of their development and their planning, planning and development. Um, the other, the, uh, what are some of the other things? Uh, the, just the dust from the roads, air quality, of course. Um, and just the immensity of the project, just uh, the feelings that some of the citizens have um, is really pretty sad when you stop to think of it because we have neighbors, people living next door to each other or family and friends who hardly talk anymore because of some of the controversies regarding frac sand mining and all that goes on. Jobs, that was a big, jobs was a big concern um, at the time in 2008 when all of this started or even before when it started in Dunn County. But um, many of the workers who came to work here were people from other countries actually uh, to put, put some of the projects together. And many of the people who were hired are not necessarily citizens or people from this area. So those are some of the issues. Um, and uh, we're looking, I think everyone in, in Wisconsin who has had any contact with frac sand mining or in fact, living outside of the region, seeing the trains going by and all of that sort of thing is happy to think that we're going to do something about climate and um, ridding ourselves of the fossil fuel uh, dilemma. So. Awesome, thank you for that, Pat. No, yeah, you did, wonderful, and I really appreciate it. I just wanted to give a moment to maybe have um, Dwight, if you'd like to maybe add on to some of the comments that Pat shared and maybe speak to what it's like living in, um, in the shadow of some of these corporations and maybe what your neighbors that I believe are beef herders experience. Um, if you'd like to talk any other points, please go ahead. Okay, I got unmuted here. I'm having all kinds of connection problems this morning. Sorry about that. No yes, problem. To follow up, follow up on Pat's comments. Uh, it, it really creates a scenario with these industrial sand mines. Um, it, it's the classic wicked problem. There's really no linear way to resolve the issue. It's it's very complex. But uh, all of the the, the issues. Uh, physical and emotional uh, uh, that she mentioned are are accurate. Um, I live about a kilometer away from a sand mine that the site is 670 acres of active site that uh, has the capacity for 2.7 million tons of silica sand production annually. And then they also purchased an additional 350 acres. So uh, yeah, we've got about a thousand acres worth of uh, land that is uh, potentially impacted by this operation. And so um, one of the things I've done to try to deal with this is to get involved with local politics and local government. And so I, after this uh, sand mine was uh, put into place and operating and creating all the problems that Pat mentioned. Uh, I ran for office and uh, became the township chair, and that allowed me to be in better position uh, to try to regulate uh, their operations. Their operations in our township are uh, not regulated. We don't have any uh, uh, comprehensive zoning plan and uh, 
the, the previous board opted to not create any kind of mining ordinances that would regulate their operational procedures, which was unfortunate. Uh, we didn't get any royalties. We got basically nothing. Um, so uh, I, I did make an effort to uh, set up an advisory council that would at least uh, extend the communication lines between our, our sand mine operations and our citizenry. We actually have in our township, which is Curran Township in west central Wisconsin, we've got three industrial sand mines located in our township uh, comprising about a third of our total acreage. So that's, uh, you know, roughly 7,500 acres worth of industrial sand mines. So it's a, it's a, a, a big issue to manage in our township. And as the town board chair now, I'm in my second term in that position, uh, I'm still dealing with not only my personal issues, but uh, a number of township citizen uh, complaints concerning, like Pat mentioned, the air, water, noise, the light pollution. Uh, and remember, industrial sand mines are major polluters. Uh, the construction hall routes, the traffic violations, uh, we actually had a couple of fatalities connected with um, trafficking the uh, sand from uh, our mine site here to the rail loadout that's uh, X number of miles away. So there was a head-on collision between two sand mine trucks and they were both the drivers were killed. Um, and then there's excessive road closures due to the train traffic uh, blocking uh, crossing sites. Uh, and then of course the blasting related complaints uh, that we've had last year, uh, excuse me, in 2019, we had 26 blasting events. Last year as they, you know, as the uh, economy slowed down their their mining operations, they only had two blasting events, and that was in uh, November uh, in 2020. So, um, but that's one thing that you want to uh, think about. Uh, a lot of times, these industrial sand mine companies will liken themselves to just you know standard quarries, and that quarries make up a, take a, up a lot larger footprint compared to industrial sand mines. But that's very misleading because uh, the quarries typically are mine in this area in the upper Midwest are mining calcium carbonate or limestone. And that's a very different substance than what they're extracting, which is silica sand, uh, which is creating uh, the air quality issues, for example, uh, that get down to the 2.5 uh, particulate matter readings and, and smaller. Uh, creating lots of health problems. So, uh, are, are you still able to hear me? Yes. Or did we I go can. on to mute? No, we okay, can hear you. Okay. Okay. I thought maybe I ended up uh, defaulting to mute here. Um, so, anyway, the, uh, we have, um, as a town board chair, uh, trying to manage these issues, I, I've tried to create advisory council action to deal with this and set up meetings and uh, that seemed like a professional way to handle it. And that uh, has worked fairly well. They tend to operate from a promotional marketing perspective when they get into those meetings. So it doesn't work in the advisory capacity that I would like it to, uh, but uh, nonetheless, we've, we've tried. And currently in our township, we have a pending, um, as of last December, a class action suit against uh, the the uh, Wisconsin province, which is again about a kilometer from uh, west of my property, and, and that's been filed by adjacent landowners uh, against the, the sand mine operators and the uh, mining construction company and their foreign-owned uh, fictitious insurance companies. So it, it uh, there are many legal aspects, uh, as as Pat mentioned, uh, it tends to tear communities apart because you have a group that is employed by these companies uh, that will be defensive about their actions or people that have sold property at inflated prices and, and have benefited financially 
from those transactions. And then you have people that are concerned with the environment. Um, and when you look at this from a sustainability perspective, I mean, there's just no box that industrial sand mines check. There's, there's really no long-term economic benefit. All the jobs are glorified temp jobs and uh, they don't provide benefits. And uh, I mean, it's an hourly wage and it's just a job. Um, it, in, in terms of uh, the uh, environment, I mean, you have uh, uh, obviously uh, lots of issues with uh, soil, starting with soil and uh, water and air concerns, uh, as mentioned earlier. And then the social aspects, I mean, you, you lose um, the friendly community that you once enjoyed, the peace and quiet uh, that was once part of our uh, Smith Cooley Valley, we'll call it. So um, that's a real kind of condensed version of what it's uh, like to be living uh, within the shadow of operations like that. But it's important to note that uh, there's always something that you can do. Uh, you need to, uh, for those listening and uh, participating today, uh, I think it's important to identify those issues and get control of your local officials uh, on the township and county levels, and then organize your resources and document and then uh, get a plan of action together. I've done tons of public hearings, letters to the editor. Um, we've, we've, uh, I've reported uh, violations, uh, one of which was a year ago last August where the, this sand mine operation deposited over 400,000 gallons of orange toxic sludge into our surface and groundwaters. Um, and um, so, I mean, there, there's uh, um, lots of um, action plan items that you want to put into practice. Um, there, there, of course, there's the legal process. You're going to want to connect with uh, legal staff um, and, um, you know, get some opinions on uh, uh, however you're proceeding to deal with these companies uh, because they're well-versed in, uh, they have a playbook that they follow to deal with the public at large. And uh, that's been largely successful, but not, not always. So um, that's, that's some of my background and uh, the way I'm trying to resolve some of these issues locally. Wonderful. We really appreciate um, you sharing all those different ways to get involved. And I think that really turns nicely over to our third panelist speaker before we open it up to general questions from the audience. I wanted to go ahead and pass it over to you, Ken. The question I have is if, much like the others have shared, if you could briefly maybe just mention your personal overview of how you got involved in these efforts and around frac sand mining and their operations. And also just if you could speak to what the Chippewa County Land Conservation and Forestry Division is doing in respect to like looking towards reclamation and how success um, looks in that area. And open to you. Okay, um, my name is Ken Schmidt. Um, I'll make one correction. I was a former dairy farmer in Southern Clark County by Nielsville. And back in 2004 when I married my wife, I moved up to Western Chippewa County and we have a grass-based cow-calf operation and we sell a little cattle equipment, handling equipment on the side now. And I got involved back in 2008 when the first sand mine moved into Chippewa County. And nobody at the time knew a whole lot. There's a lot more information out there now. And I got on the county board at that time for one term and now I'm back on the county board again, also sitting on land conservation committee. And I wanna stress that what I say here today is not official county positions, but my thoughts and opinions and ob observations. So just to make, put that disclaimer in right away. Um, something, I'll talk about reclamation law a little bit in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, the reclamation law was passed about 25 to 30 years ago and it was a compromise between environmentalists and uh, industry and at that time the industry was primarily small sand and gravel operators and highway construction equipments looking for aggregate for construction projects there was one or two maybe four sand mines in the state at the time and i'll talk about one of those a little later on it's badger and it was a it was a they had an operation by uh, berlin i believe it was and then they started a bigger mine down by taylor and that was started in the mid 70s and in Wisconsin, reclamation law is administered by the counties 
and there's minimum and maximum standards that you must adhere to. There's a few things you have to do, but there's also certain thresholds you can't cross as to what you require. And so basically in the end, nobody's 100% happy, but everybody gets a little something out of it, I guess. And a few of the things that they can require is counties require bonds to assure some level of reclamation and how that amount is determined varies. Uh, a lot of counties just use a straight per acre fee and Chippewa County does that pretty much in the outwash areas for just small five, 10, 20 or 40 acre uh, area uh, mines for local projects. But on industrial sand mines, they take into account the amount of tonnage that needs to be moved to kind of regrade the site and to stabilize it and then to seed it down. And after seeding is completed in Chippewa County, we have a performance period of five to 10 years before the bond is fully released. Once you get the final grading done, the bond can be reduced because a lot of the work that's required if the company defaults is already done. So, and we see that um, many of the mines are listing prairie or wildland as a end use and that end use has to be stated before the uh, reclamation permit is granted by the county. Um, the prairie itself comes with, the whole reclamation thing comes with a lot of issues in that after the bond is finally released, there's generally no hold on the land as to what can be done with it or how it's maintained. So prairies require a fair amount of maintenance. You probably should, you have to have prescribed burns probably at least every three years, maybe more often depending on the growth and what you have growing there to, to keep your species mixed the way you want it and uh, get your stated goals. If it's a large area, like a lot of these sand mines, you probably should split it into different years. So not everything get burns in the same year. So you get kind of a refuge for insects and wildlife in the year that you burn the whole thing or burn an area so they can move back in after the burn is completed. And that's gonna fall upon the landowners in some shape, manner or form. They can probably get advice how to do it from somebody. Then they're either gonna to have to implement it themselves or hire somebody else to do it for them. So it remains to be seen how much dedication there will be to do that over time as uh, landowners get older or the land ex changes hands to the next landowner. So there's a lot of question marks at the end of this. Uh, let's see. And I'll, the other thing that drives on our area, sand mining is kind of, it's, it's fading away kind of because we're too far from the right rail um, and any rail in a lot of cases. We've had about a half a dozen mines that were active in Chippewa County and the closest rail was a short line rail called Progressive, but that's not really right rail. It just gets you to the main line. So then you have to pay a fee to get on the main line rail to go where you want to go. And, and you have to, and even then you still got to do a lot of trucking to get to the sand plants, which are on, usually on the rail. So that all um, costs a lot of money. And now with the, they found sand in Texas and other states. And I guess I've been told recently that they found sand in Arizona that's probably as, almost as good, if not as good as ours here in Wisconsin. And Arizona is much closer to Texas than we are. So basically the sand in Wisconsin, in Wisconsin or at least this area of Wisconsin is going north to Canada um, rather than south like it did at first. Um, our mines in the county, we've got Superior Silica, which has a mine up on Double D in 64, and they found some arsenic in the wash ponds up there. And the county and the company jointly asked DNR for support on that issue in the wash pond. And they're working among three different bureaus of DNR on it to determine site conditions and options. Well, they've been working on this for probably a year and a half, and they haven't really gotten back to us. Uh, DNR with COVID, uh, COVID certainly made the matters worse, but they were kind of in a disarray before that already. So eventually they'll probably get around to it. We'll see what they come up with. Uh, a little further south, Preferred Sands has registered their intent to begin final reclamation this year, which means they're going to have to do the rough grading and eventually get it seated down and start that process. 
Chippewa Sands has transferred the permit or reclamation permit to McCourt Reclamation Services out of Texas. They'll have 120 days now to determine if they want to mine that site or just reclaim it. So time will tell there. EOG has two mines in the county, the DS mine that they'll keep for the time being and the uh, S&S mine, which is 230 some acres, they will be done with their rough grading shortly. And then they'll have to seed it down and they'll go into that uh, observation period and maintenance period till they get the rest of the bond released and it's then goes back to landowner. And then we have one big mine in the southwest part of the township that Pat alluded to. It's about 1,100 acres of land that they control leases on her. And that's Albertville Valley. And right now it's kind of in a holding pattern. It's, they have their reclamation permit and they've had their license from the town for a period of time now. And they are sitting on Canadian National Rail, which is kind of a right rail to go north, is my understanding, or west. But so far, nothing's happened. I think with the downturn in oil prices and stuff, the that they're just kind of sitting there and trying to decide what whether to continue with the project or probably drop it. That's just my speculation. So um, I guess we'll turn it over to somebody else and answer questions. It's actually easier than trying to explain things. So awesome. We really appreciate that. Um, so this is the time where those of you that are joining us today, uh, if you have any questions to put towards uh, Pat, uh, Ken or Dwight, please go ahead and um, you can type them in the chat and I can read them aloud for you. Or if you'd like, you could um, raise your hand and I can call upon participants. And then Shannon, if you wanna go ahead, we could probably stop sharing screen just so we can see our um, guests. Thank you. And clarifying questions are welcome in open hour space. So like, if you need to know a question that was you want to raise a question like what is rail or something like that, you can ask those too. Don't be timid about it. Just doing a quick scan here to see if there's any raised hands. So uh, just wanted to also bring maybe a question forward that's kind of related to tying all these together is just thinking a little bit more, Pat, maybe you'd be able to answer this, um, the role of annexation. You guys have talked a lot about the difference um, for these mines and when companies want to be annexed into the communities rather than counties, are you able to uh, maybe tease out a little bit of those differences and why they might be interested in doing that? Well, yes. Um, actually, in Chippewa Falls itself, annexation took place months before the actual announcement about the Fraxan processing plant coming into the city limits. And they actually, it's, it's typical that uh, annexation occurs where a city or a municipality uh, or a village can actually, through law, annex properties from the town surrounding them into the city limits. Well, it does take away some of the taxa taxation developments or, or the taxation uh, positives in the town uh, and it adds land to the city or village. Um, but there are some definitely some, definitely some uh, disadvantages to doing that all. I would say that um, for example, we don't know, for example, what happened with the city of Chippewa Falls and if there were any positives as a result of that, because, because actually our Canadian Sand and Profits was the company that came in and it eventually switched to, um, and I think they were just the forerunner of the uh, EOG resources plant. Uh, so we don't, I don't know if the city has has actually gained too much from the annexation in a sense they've gained an industry. Uh, but um, in the village of New Auburn, for example, they annexed a part of a town, the town of Dover into the village. And there were lots of promises that were made there. 
including a new fire department, you know, um, laptops for kids in the school and various other things that were promised. And I think that in most cases, those things were met. But um, there, there are some just, it, part of the reason, for example, why annexation occurs in this case with frac sand mines is um, that, the, I mean, there's a real true advantage to the companies because there aren't as many regulations that are uh, um, established within municipalities and there are many more of them established in the counties. So that's one of the reasons. I mean, in truthfulness, that's quite a major re region or reason. But here, here we have promises that are made to these cities or municipalities by the companies that, that there'll be a, a large benefit. So, and I know um, I might refer to uh, Dwight on this one, there have been annexations made in your area there in Trempeleau County or Jackson County, not so much Jackson, but at least in the, in the Trempeleau yeah. County area. Uh, and ballooning has been a part of the issue. Can you speak to that at all? Yeah, yes, yes, I can. Yes, uh, and that is one of the levers that they use. I mentioned the playbook of these industrial sand mines along with non-disclosure agreements. One of the levers they like to use is uh, threatening townships with annexation and uh, the previous board I think they uh, submitted to that I mean they, they had a fear that if we didn't play ball with them and you know give them what they want that they would annex to the village of Hickston uh, which is adjacent to current township um, but you know they, they didn't study the law on that very carefully so it, it's a bit of a scare tactic that that can work in many cases. Um, I know a year ago, last April, uh, it hasn't happened in Jackson County, but in Trempeleau County, like you mentioned, uh, Whitehall had uh, a Supreme Wisconsin Supreme Court ruling uh, last April uh, that uh, you know nullified the the balloon on a string taking uh, where. Uh, some land in Trempeleau County was annexed to the village of Whitehall. So that was that was shut down, but not necessarily for the reasons that we'd like. Um, th there's different ways to annex. One of the ways is to get, uh, uh, you know, a unanimous uh, petition, and they were one signature short. And so the, the state law was pretty <laughs> unambiguous uh, when you write unanimous that means unanimous so they threw they dismissed that annexation based on that technicality um, there are there are other ways to annex you can go through referendums and so on so you need to work with your legal resources to get that straight but Trempeleau County uh, has a lot of silica sand reserves too like Jackson and they've actually had eight such annexations in the past decade and um, where the mine owners are trying to evade county regulations that don't apply within the city limits or the village limits. And then uh, the city of Blair uh, has sprouted out uh, with annexations for High Crush and Taylor Frack as a couple of examples. And then the, I know the city of Independence has more than doubled its area by annexations again in Trempeleau County. So you've got Independence and Whitehall, for example, that are uh, they have, they're between five and six miles apart. But because of these finger-shaped parcels that they did with that balloon on a string annexation trick, uh, they share roughly a 50-yard border where some of those weird-shaped parcels meet. But uh, you know that creates lots of issues. Um, you know you're really these irregular shaped annexations uh, violate the intent of the law and you know they lead to problems whereby the people living in those zones uh, do they do they get city services like sewer and water uh, police protection uh, when they're that far out from traditional city limits um, you can the people kind of get disenfranchised when they find themselves surrounded by you know uh, they're in, they're in a village now, and the old township went away somehow. So, 
uh, I think the courts um, have pretty much, uh, in general, gone away from these annexations. I, I think they uh, they will tend to, the courts will rule in the favor of citizenry if they have objections to these annexations for the reasons I just mentioned. Uh, they they uh, generally will uh, 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 comply with. Uh, with that, and there's there's the rule of reason and and other things that uh, uh, come into play when you're looking at these gerrymandered or crazy quilt boundaries uh, that violate regular boundary requirements. So there's some legalities there that deal with the contiguous nature of these parcels, and when they're all gerrymandered, then that that tends to violate. So it, it, these industrial sand mines think they can push you around and and threaten to annex, but that's it's actually pretty difficult to do, uh, which is a good thing in my opinion. Um, so uh, anyway, Trempeau County's had a lot of experience with that, and uh, the most interesting thing that comes to mind for me is the, the April of 2019 Supreme Court ruling that uh, you know threw out that, uh, that that said the city of Whitehall improperly annexed lands for a proposed sand mine. Um, but again, they didn't really because it was on a uh, you know a unanimous approval uh, basis. They kind of sidestepped the larger questions about the legality of such balloon on a string takings. Awesome. I don't know if that's what you wanted, but that's some of the thoughts off the top. No, we appreciate all of these insights. It's really great to hear each of your perspectives. And with that, I wanted to maybe round out with the last question that came in from Catherine. And Catherine, I'll go ahead and just maybe generalize it just a teeny bit to get each of our panelists to end um, on this note. Um, and before I ask the question, I just wanted to also state that in the chat, um, and Shannon, Stevie, and I will be sharing opportunities for you to continue this conversation and get involved. Um, Public Lab will be hosting a workshop in coordination with uh, Patricia um, on if you're in the Wisconsin area or grading surrounding region and you're looking for ways to like learn some of these methods on how to yourself bring action to your communities around FRAXAM, they'll be hosting that later this month in February. So I'll be dropping the register link from Public Lab's website there. And then Shannon, if you wanted to take a moment before we ask the last question about your events that are coming up. Yeah, thank you. We have um, an environmental justice film series at the moment. Um, you know, all these issues are very interrelated. So while we don't focus on Fraxin mining specifically in the film series, there are some really great um, independent documentaries that you can check out. So I'll drop the link to that. And I'll also share the link to yeah, the audio story and the Frac Tracker mobile app in case you're curious to check that out. Awesome. So in our last five minutes, uh, what I'd really love to hear in regards to Catherine's question is Catherine asks, speaking kind of from your perspectives that you've brought today, how do you bring citizen interest and industry concerns together for meaningful discussions and either town meetings or other spaces you organize in? And what would you like to see going forward? So if you all could just maybe share like your hopes um, for either 2021 or beyond, I'll go ahead and start with you. Um, maybe Dwight, if you're still on, um, I'll have, sure. uh, or excuse me, yeah, Ken, sorry, let's go with Ken because we haven't heard you for a moment. Then we'll go Patricia and then end with you, um, Dwight. Okay, thank you. Very good. Helps to unmute, I guess. Um, I guess as a government official, you have to listen to both sides and kind of try and hit the ball in the middle. It, it's not an easy role. Uh, from in the beginning up here, there was strong interest in the mines as an economic driver. And I like to quip that it's not really an economic driver, it's just transferring wealth from a number of neighbors to one neighbor. Uh, and I think that as time has gone by, most of the proponents have kind of decided it isn't what it was billed to be. And there were a lot of tall tales told in the beginning. So now I think that there's more critical oversight um, being provided and asked for by neighbors. And Chippewa County as it stands now, unless that big mine starts in the Southwest part of the county, it's it's on a downturn and i think within a number not too many years a major percentage of our mines will be in some process of reclamation if not fully reclaimed 
uh, whatever we're left with after that process is over and the bonds are released. Awesome. And then Patricia, do you have any comments? Well, uh, organizing, organizing is one of those things that I've been working at for the last 12 years going on 13 uh, in a sense. Um, education, of course, that's my background, is absolutely critical to uh, some of the things that, well, I mean, to this whole effort. And outreach is also very critical. Um, knowing that frac sand mining and all of the frac sand that's mined goes to hydraulic fracturing places really is an indicator that I need to keep in touch with those people who are out there in the hinterlands who are working on some of the efforts like in Pennsylvania, New York, um, North Dakota, and a lot of other places where we have mining or where we have uh, uh, drilling and so on and hydraulic fracturing going on. So even I can't, there's no way that with all the complications that exist out there, can I possibly keep track of all of the, all of the information? There's just absolutely no way. My mind is just cluttered with it because I get all kinds of emails and all kinds of questions and calls and all of that sort of thing as part of this organizing element. But um, educating is important and uh, actually challenging some of the mining companies with some of the things that we're doing really right now is critical. Um, and I just have to tell you this, that we, uh, I've been working with Dr. Crispin Pierce at, uh, and a team of workers, by the way, including Dwight, have been working with, uh, and attorneys as well, have been working with uh, Dr. Crispin Pierce at UW-Eau Claire. And uh, we have received several grants uh, to put out purple air monitors so that we can, we can figure out um, just what's happening air quality wise and what's happening to the health of individuals who live near these frac sand mines or processing plants or transload stations. And our aim is to put out 65 of them before the end of the year. And this month in February, um, he and his interns will be working on just that, inst installing purple air monitors, but also maintaining them and also reviewing data. And I think he's found some very interesting things, particularly in Bloomer, where the life expectancy is shortened, and in New Auburn, where the life expectancy is, is shortened. And then you look at some of the other places down where Dwight lives or any other places that, where we have out purple air monitors and mines, and processing plants and so on, that the data will begin to show that life expectancy is, is shorter. And so there's other elements to this whole thing and that the last grant that we received um, was, was a significant one in that the, um, some of the larger equipment, which the citizens all got together on, we contributed $65,000 to purchase two of these monitors. One will be established at a certain location or is established. And uh, every week uh, data from the filters can actually be sent to the lab in Madison for, for, um, for analysis. It's, for me, it's really important that we have connections and collaboration. I worked a lot with Stevie, I've worked a lot with Ted I've worked with people in Pennsylvania, particularly through the Damascus citizens and Barb there, who has created posters on frac sand mining and so on. So there's a lot, there's a lot to be learned. There's a lot of organizing that needs to be done. And it wouldn't be without the help of the people, the leaders who are who I'm working with now, but other people in the state who have reported various things happening that we would be able to achieve, I think, what we've done. Um, and I think there, there's a substantial movement on the part of the people who live in these areas to do something. And actually we have litigation going on right now with at least 80 individuals. Sorry, I'm sorry about that, 50 individuals. And we're aiming, we hope to have a few more than that added. So um, 
that's going to cost the company something perhaps, if nothing more than being a warning to them about the impacts health-wise. Um, it, it's pretty significant work. And with that, um, any last comments from you, Dwight, to wrap up all the comments shared already? Sure, I'll take this from a you know town board chair perspective. Again, and all of this discussion raises lots and lots of questions. You know, how do we maintain stability through this period of contentious land use change? And you know, what are the effective ways to bridge communication gaps between these groups with differing worldview perspectives? Um, and you know, as a town board chair. Um, I, I think, you know, we've got a, uh, as a board, we've got a responsibility to address safety, health, and well-being, of course. And when you're looking at all of the public nuisance issues associated with uh, surface mining operations, uh, you know, including air quality, uh, elevated particulate matter from blasting, mining, stockpiling of the sand, trucking, et cetera, the water quality issues, the, the quantity of water they're using, a million plus gallons a day, and then the, uh, the heavy metals accumulation in the reclaimed mine sites, et cetera. I, I just believe that citizen input is critical to influence the decision-making process of elected officials. Um, and so what I've done is, I had mentioned earlier, I set up an advisory council uh, with some of our uh, local mine businesses so uh, affected people would have a chance to get direct information from them and then at our town board meetings um, i have one tonight for example um, i always have that on my agenda uh, sand mine uh, management and so uh, tonight uh, smart sand is coming in and they're reviewing their road use agreements and the bond levels and that's important because in this particular case, we need to keep the road surface proper, you know, whether it's uh, resurfacing or reconstructing if they damage the roads enough, which they certainly do. And then there's a bridge over the Trempeau River, which, I mean, if you damage that bridge, then that puts our township into millions of dollars worth of liability. Uh, so, you know, those bond issues are, are critical, but that's just a real quick case in point where I have them on the agenda every meeting and then they have representatives that come to the meeting and then address our our concerns or they may have specific things that they need uh, answered from the board as well so it's a two-way street um, but uh, the citizen input if you need to think about creating avenues to allow for that type of feedback uh, again we're we're trying to make linear something that's really not very linear but I like to put it into a systems approach and you know it, it, it's a lot of uh, systems are a lot of uh, discrete entities and they're made up of smaller pieces of the puzzle so uh, you just knock it down one at a time the best that you can awesome and with that i just wanted to say with much gratitude to the three of you for joining us today again pat dwight and ken Thank you, Shannon, Ted, and Stevie, and Joe for also helping me coordinate this event today. We couldn't have done it without all of our, our contributions. Um, thank you so much for all of you that invited someone to come today. It was a great turnout. And I wanted to go ahead and say thanks for also sticking with us about six or so minutes after. Um, I really wanna say thanks again. And if you have any questions, you can always um, reach out to any of us at Frack Tracker, our public lab. I just dropped in the chat. Um, where you can find the recording later this week on our open hour archive. Um, and I hope you all have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Thanks everybody who came today. Thanks, Ashley. Thanks everyone. You're welcome. And I'll be stopping the recording.